I'm Cappy McGar, and I serve on the Board of Trustees of the LBJ Foundation, and it's an honor to welcome you to the LBJ Library for what I know is going to be a great conversation. A big thank you to our sponsors for the evening, St. David's Healthcare and the Moody Foundation, who do such incredible work every day. Following the program, book sales will continue in the upper lobby, and also after the program, I invite friends of the LBJ Library members to join us in the reception of the Great Hall. One of the great things about LBJ is that there's a story for just about every situation, and there's two that I think that are relevant tonight. The first is about a special car that LBJ had at his ranch that could basically turn into a boat and go in water. So he would take people for rides in this thing without telling them what the car would do. And he would drive up this big hill down to the lake and then he'd blast down the hill like the Apollo rocket. And then he'd tell his guests his brakes had stopped working. <laughs> you know, back then a president went downhill towards danger at breakneck speed, pretending the brakes weren't working while betting he'd stay afloat at the end. That was called a prank. <laughs> Today we just call it a government shutdown. The second story took place when LBJ signed the Civil Rights Act in 1964. At the time, his daughter Lucy was 17. When Lucy asked why he gave Everett Dirksen, the top Senate Republican, a pen at the signing, at the bill signing, her father gave her a disappointing look and said, Lucy, I didn't have to convince one of the great civil rights leaders for, to be for that legislation. They were already for it. But because of Everett Dirksen's decision to support the law and bring his supporters with him, the, civil, the great civil rights leaders and I have a law, not just a bill. That's why Senator Dirksen got a pen. Imagine that. Republican and a Democrat working together and a president grateful for the political opponent. But how would LBJ feel about if he saw the country today? An at atmosphere so poisonous of diff that different parties hardly talk to each other. The way people attack each other so viciously on Twitter. I think he would be devastated that the Great Society had been replaced by the Great Schism. We trust th we when trust in Congress is lower than the glasses on Chuck Schumer's nose, <laughs> it's pretty clear something's got to change. So that's why I'm so glad that Lee Berman, and who was White House Social Secretary under President George W. Bush, and Jeremy Bernard, who was, had the same job on President Obama, have written their new book, Treating People Well. It's fantastic. And I'm not just saying that because I happen to be in it. <laughs> sure I am. But my experience in producing seven White House shows and events for the president sure gave me new appreciation for what Lee and Jeremy have been through. For example, Paul McCartney was going to perform in the East Room of the White House for a show I was executive producer on. Paul's bodyguard, his armed bodyguard, tried to come in with a gun. Of course, the Secret Service said, absolutely not. This is the safest place in the world. That's when Sir Paul's team tried to sneak the bodyguard by putting his name on the production side being a part of the production. The Secret Service caught that too, and they were not happy at all. So they said Paul McCartney's bodyguard couldn't come in the White House at all. The fight with Paul's team and the Secret Service got to the point where it looked like there was no bodyguard, there would be no Paul McCartney performing at the White House. So I called Juliana Smoot, the White House Social Secretary at the time, and she set the meeting up with the head of the Secret Service where we got the whole thing straightened out. If it wasn't for Juliana's help, Paul McCartney might not have shown up at the White House. It's a good example of why social secretaries are the unheralded heroes of the White House. They are basically quiet problem solvers. Heck, McCart McCartney basically wrote the song, We Can Work It Out. So listen closely what Lee and Jeremy have to say today. They've seen people at their best and they've seen people at their worst and they know the power that comes simply from treating people well. Today, we're fortunate to have a Washington legend as a moderator, Capricia Marshall. She was social secretary in the Clinton administration and chief of protocol under President Barack Obama. The German ambassador called her Superwoman. But before I turn it over to Superwoman, let me close with a question that LBJ asked, it's something that we're still asking today. In August in 1965, two astronauts 
set an American record for the longest duration in space for the first time. But as, in, but as our eyes turned to a new frontier, LBJ was thinking a little bit closer to home. Quote, he said, as man draws near to the stars, why should he not also draw nearer to his neighbors? So we're 50 years in this time of deep division. His question is more important than ever. Lee and Jeremy can help us find that answer. So let me welcome without further ado, Capricia, Jeremy, and Lee. can't believe you told the ending of the book. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, Kathy, so very much. And uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, Kathy has been a dear, dear friend for, for many, many years of every administration. Um, I want to thank you and also Larry Temple, chair of the board here at the LBJ Foundation, and Amy Barbie, executive director of the LBJ Foundation, and all the other members of the board for inviting us to be here this evening with everyone. Additionally, I want to thank Mark Updegrove, uh, who regrettably is out of town for this event, and also Sarah McCracken for all of her wonderful help in arranging all of the fantastic details Details. Um, it is such a pleasure to be here with my two dear, dear friends, Lee and Jeremy. Uh, before we get into the conversation, though, I was asked to make sure that everyone knows I'm going to leave a few minutes at the end of our discussion for questions. So while we're talking, um, you might want to take some time and think of a few questions. There are microphones in the aisles up here near to the front. And so in about 40 minutes or so, if you feel like you have a, a wonderful question to, to ask our two fabulous authors, please just line up behind uh, the microphones and then we'll start to, we'll start to ask those. Uh, but it is such a pleasure to be here with both of you and congratulations. It is beautiful. What a beautiful book. Oh, thank you. Um, I clearly am reading it a lot. I am uh, turning down pages and making sure that I tell my 17-year-old son all of the wonderful <laughs> advice that, uh, that you have shared. Uh, so I hope that everyone now has loaded up on their Valentine's Day presents for all of their family members. And if not, they're going to continue to sell books. And it's in all of the bookstores around town. So make sure that you get those. Um, the Social Secretaries is a wonderful club. Uh, we make sure that no matter the political background, uh, no matter the president that's in office, we take care of one another. We give each other really frank advice, and we celebrate one another's achievements. And so I'm so proud to be here this evening to celebrate this wonderful achievement of the two of them. And I know secretly that I am your favorite social secretary <laughs> sister, right? Without question, at least for the next, what, 60, 90 minutes. Excellent, <laughs> excellent, excellent. Although we do need to celebrate our wonderful social secretary sister, Bess Abel, who was President Johnson's social right. secretary. Greatest storyteller, hands down, of any storyteller. And I'm sure we're going to hear a few of those stories uh, this evening. I thought that we'd begin first in the two of you telling a bit of your, your backgrounds and, uh, and, and, and uh, how you came up with the collaboration. So I'd like to start with you, Lee. On, um, it's been so wonderful getting to know you over the years, you and your fabulous husband, Wayne, who's here this evening uh, with you, uh, and, and being a part of the Washington, D.C. Um, you know, neighbors and, and friends. Uh, you have a very special relationship with Mrs. Bush, and it's so clear that uh, through the foreword that she wrote in the book, it is just so warm and, and lovely, just like her. When you see her, she has this just elegant calmness about her. Um, tell us a little bit about your background, and how did you become the White House Social Secretary? Well, I am a very unlikely candidate to have ever been a White House Social Secretary. I, I grew up on a grape farm in Ohio. I didn't have any playmates until I went to kindergarten, so I was always a very socially backward child. 
Um, when I went to college, that all changed, you know, the way it does when you go to college. And I was interested in politics. I worked in Washington for a number of years. And then I became a full-time mother for t 10 years when I had a call to come and interview for the position of social secretary to the vice president. So I worked for the Cheneys for several years uh, as social secretary and then later her chief of staff and thought I was finished. Um, and then after President Bush won the second term, Mrs. Bush interviewed me to come be the social secretary. And I was deeply intimidated by the whole idea of it. But as I had always considered it a great character failing, that I was so awkward and uncomfortable around people, I thought, this is exactly what I need to do with my life. And I did. And it helped me so much that it's part of the reason Jeremy and I came around to writing this book, because all social behavior is learned, and we can all get better at it. And if you're uncomfortable when you walk into a room full of people and you don't know where to start, there are specific things you can do to make that a more pleasant experience. And so that's my unlikely path. Well, my, Jeremy. Mine, uh, I also was a very shy kid. I, I would be on the steps at, in kindergarten at recess, and I didn't want to go play in the, the you know, Kindergarten teachers can be mean. And they, they were like, Jeremy, get off the step and go. Come play with other. I hated it. I hated it. And um, so if you had told me then that there was this job and that I'd eventually have it, I would be like, it's the wrong person. But uh, I, was, I started working for the Obamas in 2007 at the beginning of the campaign. Got to know them, which, as you know, it's always a plus to know them before they're in the White House because it's intimidating. I mean, you have the Secret Service, you have the hell to the chief, it's all very mm -hmm. uh, overwhelmed, can be overwhelming. But I had a great relationship with them from the campaign. I was serving in the administration, I was actually living in Paris, working for the US ambassador in Paris, and got an email saying, would you throw your hat in the ring for this job? And I was like, yeah, <laughs> really? No, I mean, that, there's no way. But sure, I'll try it. And I flew out and I did the interview. And I told uh, Mrs. Obama right off the start, I said, you know, I really don't know flowers. And I don't know place settings. I don't know China. I don't really know if I'm the right person for this job. And she goes, that, you'll have people to help you with that. I need someone with good political judgment. And it wasn't political as Democrat, Republican, but on how you deal with people. Because what our job was so, important, as you know, uh, is making all the guests, no matter where they're from or what party, welcomed. And that was our job. And so you represent the president and first lady, so anything you do could embarrass them. So we were very careful. And it was great in a way because we learned, well, we should really do this all the time. But it's easy in this time, I think, to Bad behavior is contagious. Mm. And it's very easy to get into that routine of responding. I always say, no, don't. If you see something on Facebook or someone writes something and you are angry, you want it, wait till the next day because um, it stays with you forever and it represents you. Mm. Well, I wanted to also say welcome home. Thank Jeremy. you, thank you, San Antonio. There's San Antonians here, I know. It's a wonderful, it must be fabulous to be back here in Texas. Now, Jeremy, Jeremy and I have a very special relationship because as he served as social secretary, I was serving in another capacity as chief of protocol. And we really were at times linked arm in arm on so many of the events and memories you discussed. For me, uh, it was like going down wonderful memory lane. And uh, you, of course, worked for the fabulous President uh, Bush, excuse me, President Obama, and President uh, and Mrs. Uh, Obama. It yeah. was um, spectacular working for, uh, for both of them. Um, it's, it's, Cappy referred to this a little bit, and, and you did just now, Jeremy, but you know, this getting along between Democrats and Republicans and in Washington, D.C., and, and how this is seen throughout the country. It's so unique that people that come from relatively different political philosophies uh, collaborate so beautifully. I mean, the, the book is written in a way that is almost seamless, their voice between the two of you. How did you come up with the collaboration? What was that like, then, working with one another? 
First, I just have to say, having Capricia here is like giving you all a whole nother encyclopedia of White House stories. So as you're thinking about questions, this is the Clinton administration right here, and she's got wonderful stories herself. Um, we really felt our collaboration was pretty natural and easy. Um, the job, as Jeremy said, of the social secretary is to always welcome everyone. And we found ourselves, and we found ourselves watching our bosses work extra hard with the people who were there at the White House who were not their supporters. They would have these long conversations where they would try to find something that they had in common. It would be movies or sports or whatever it was that they could break through and build a human connection. And I think that's what we all need to remember these days as things get less and less pleasant in the public arena and then on the internet as well. You know, politics does not need to be in everything. And when we make everything a political issue, we run the risk of making enemies of people who simply have a different point of view. So for us, we were boxhole friends together, and, and all of the social secretaries feel this way. If you've lived at a certain experience, you can understand and appreciate where that person is coming from. And because you meet so many different kinds of people from different cultures and different walks of life, you learn to be a lot more open-minded about things. So I think it made the collaboration pretty easy. I've, I met Lee at, there's a tradition that the outgoing social secretary hosts a lunch for the new social secretary and the former socials come and it's a, you know, one of those secret clubs that no one can know anything about. But we had this lunch, I met Lee there and then Lee hosted a lunch for me a couple of weeks later and then we would see each other and as I would call you or ask often in the hallways, ask you, how did you deal with this? Or what did you do? Did you change staff? And uh, I would call Lee and Gail and different, and it was when, for uh, the, every year, uh, we, uh, I would host a lunch in the uh, West Wing uh, for all the former socials, and then we'd like have dessert in the blue room or something. And Mrs. Obama on the, my first one, came down to say hello to everyone, and she said it just so perfectly, she said, it's not about politics, it's about being a patriot. And you, you know, you are all welcomed here anytime. Mm. And uh, that was something, when we started talking, we were like, Roxanne Roberts from the Washington Post suggested we do a book together because she said, you guys get along great, different administrations, different parties, write a book together. She, I think she was thinking more of a entertaining book and entertainment and we were like, well, we, what would it be? And we worked on it for a while. And this, we really thought, what was so important about our job? Everyone thinks it's about throwing a state dinner or a big party. There's so much more to it. But at the bottom line, it's about how you treat people. It absolutely, absolutely is. And Jeremy was incredibly kind to, to all of us um, by, by extending that invitation to the former uh, social secretaries and including us during the, the Christmas holidays. Uh, the decorations were always so fantastic, really fantastic. And I was so pleased that it has continued on. Right. So we were all just there recently yeah. in December yeah. enjoying, a, enjoying a, a luncheon together. Um, I love reading about the first days in the White House. You know, those, those first moments, it's, it's so intimidating. It's, it, takes, it, it, it takes your breath away when you walk through the gate of the White House. I will tell you a real quick story about my first day, seeing as Ali gave me per permission. <laughs> I, um, we were st I was staying with the Clintons in, at Blair House, which is the president's guest house, and it's across the street on Pennsylvania Avenue. And during that time, there was actually traffic still on Pennsylvania Avenue. Now it's been closed off for security purposes. I, um, I was given the duty of making sure that the First Lady's gown was taken over and into the White House after, after noon, after the inauguration. And, um, and I was so nervous. I wanted to make sure the gown got there. There was nothing that was lost. You know, I had the shoes and I had everything all packaged up and, and, and it's literally right across the street. And so I, was, I asked, how do you get into the White House? And someone said to me, well, you wave. You're waved in. You're waved in. I thought, well, that's so odd. You're waved in. 
So I just took the gown and I went over and I stood in front of the Secret Service booth and I began waving. <laughs> I'm here, let me in. And the guard is looking, I mean, I, you can see the guards and they're looking at me like, and they're looking at each other and they're howling like, ha, ha, look at this, you know, and I'm like, well, that is not going to work. And finally, a friend of mine who knew the process, handed his license over. Of course, he had clearances, his date of birth, social security number, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, I'm waving like crazy, Mike. And he looked at me and he goes, no, WAVE stands, it's an acronym, it stands for some security thing for how you get in. He goes, don't worry, I'll wave you in. So that was my first day <laughs> trying to get into the White House uh, with the first lady's gown. All I thought was, she will have nothing to wear tonight. I will have nothing for her to wear tonight. So what was your first days like in the White House? It, it's, a, it's overwhelming to a degree. You just can't believe am I really here, and when are they going to find out that that was a mistake and I, it shouldn't be me. Um, but what was so great is uh, Juliana, my predecessor, was able to lap over one day as long as I wasn't paid until the next day because they were very strict about payroll. And so I go in and she, I'm following her around and Everyone is just so great. I, I go by to say hello to the, in the outer oval, to the people there, and the president comes out and is like, hey, it's good to have you in the family, and everyone was so warm. I ran into you in the mess, the White House mess, where Eating. we would go get uh, <laughs> consistently mediocre food. And <laughs> we, uh, but uh, you were so warm, and you were so, because Juliana said, oh, I want to introduce you, and you're like, I know Jeremy, mm -hmm. and, just so warm, and the only thing that kind of threw me off was as I get into, settled in my office, I noticed these steps, and I was like, what are those steps for? And Stacey Koo, who was my assistant at the time, said, oh, those are, because your windows are not actually just windows, they're doors, and they open out onto the roof of the part of the White House, and I was like, Oh, that's cool. And she goes, just make sure you call the Secret Service first so they don't shoot you. <laughs> and I said, shouldn't there be a sign or something? I mean, what if you weren't here? And I, so it was, uh, there were a lot of things to get used to. Uh, my first days were helped along by the fact that my predecessor, Kathy Fenton, was there and we overlapped for about a month. And she took me around and introduced me to all the resident staff who are so important to the how the White House runs every day because these are people who stay throughout their careers. They don't leave when a president leaves. And they really hold the sense of tradition and the way things are done, the eggnog recipe. Um, and so they're very important to teaching the rest of us as we come in what the standards and the expectations are. And I remember at the end of the day, Kathy gave me this enormous photograph of the extended Bush family. It was about 150 people in one photo. And she said, you need to learn them all. And I said, why? And she said, oh, they come here a lot. And you know, this is a close-knit family. They expect to be recognized like family, and they will really appreciate it. And it was probably the best advice she gave me, because there were Bush family members popping in and out all the time. And if you recognize them and welcome them, they were just thrilled. And that it carried on, it carries on today when uh, Barbara Bush and George H.W. Bush come to the White House, you would just see all these doors popping open all over that you didn't even know were there and staff running out to meet them because they just had such a great sense of affection for them. Oh, that's so, so true. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember those days. You know, they, they, they create a real bond mm -hmm. um, over the years that they are there. And each of us serve presidents that were there for uh, eight years. And so um, that bond really becomes quite close. And, and even thereafter, I attended the funeral of um, one of the White House butlers that Mrs. Bush also attended. And I, was, I was quite touched by that. And I think that everyone in the executive mansion was very touched by that expression as well. Um, so just sort of a toss-up question. Uh -oh. Favorite memory? For my 
it's tough to say it, this is a favorite, not absolute favorite, but uh, Gail Burt once told me that your first date dinner is like the first love. It, it's, it, nothing can compare. I'm gonna be honest, I don't remember my first love, but I do remember the first date dinner, and it was the <laughs> Germany state dinner, and it was so frightening, because I had just started, it was like two months into it, and everything was just moving along so well, because you were there at the protocol, my staff had been there before me, so I was just watching all these moving parts in the weeks that, we're leading up to the state dinner. And the day before, I went in to brief Mrs. Obama, and I brought someone with me that had been there in case I got stuck and they could answer the question. And Mrs. Obama could see the absolute fear and shock in my eye at this, you know, uh, dinner. And she said, you know what, I know where to go. This is easy. They make a much bigger deal than it is. Just follow me, you'll be great. And she would walk into rooms when I was first there, and she'd see me, and she'd kind of give a wink, this feeling of, you, you belong here and welcome. And that, I thought, was really uh, important to me, and it really helped. And the state dinner was beautiful out mm -hmm. in the Rose Garden, but because the State Department would not give us money for it. We couldn't have a tent in case it rained. And so we got this little bitty Fingers. budget. And so everyone thinks, oh, well you work at White House, must have had a great budget. It was horrible. But we had this dinner outside, but there was a slight chance of rain. And the military office across the way, they were keeping track of it. And they said, we would say 20% chance. And I, thought, you know, usually I say, when in doubt, don't, but it looks so good, let's go for it. And it occurred, it was beautiful, but as the night went on, it got more and more humid. That storm was coming, and I just couldn't wait till they left, and it turned out perfect. It, it, didn't, perfect. it did not rain for a couple more hours. The next day, Mrs. Obama said to me, we were talking about it, and she said, you know, at one point last night, Barack looked at me and he says, you know, this is really beautiful, but you guys took a hell of a chance. <laughs> and she goes, Barack, it's, it's not like we didn't have a backup plan. And she looked at me and she goes, we did have a backup plan. <laughs> and I said, that gate I looked at because I thought if this goes sour, uh, that's the gate I'm leaving. I'll be the shortest term social secretary. And she goes, well, did we have a backup plan? I said, don't ask questions you don't want to know the answer to. <laughs> and, in, in retrospect, I think as time was there and we got more cautious, you know, we, we, were, we learned to be cautious. I wouldn't probably make the same de uh, decision and we had the, Turk, uh, the uh, press conference in the Rose Garden that time. They ran late and it started raining. So That's right. I, I learned to be more cautious and probably wouldn't do it the same way. So I'm glad I didn't know better. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was social secretary in 2005 and 2006, which was a time when the war in Iraq was not going well. It was before the surge. And it was an embattled White House. Um, and we had an event every year called the Iftar Dinner, and it was a celebration of the breaking of the Ramadan fast. And we, the president always invited all of the ambassadors from countries with large Muslim populations. He invited various uh, imams from around the country, and they would arrive at a certain time, and it had to be timed very exactly. And exactly as the sun set, we were allowed to serve food, and then they were invited in for dinner. But before that, we had arranged the east wing, we'd covered all the portraits, we'd brought in prayer rugs, and we had an imam standing in the grand foyer calling the guests to prayer if they wanted to come and pray before the breaking of the fast. And I hadn't been at the White House very long then, and I remember standing there and thinking, with all that is going on in Iraq right now and, and the difficulties this country is having, to see the way this religion is being honored here is just the kind of tolerance that I would like to see in my country. And I was, it was a very proud moment, which is why it's memorable to me. Mm. 
Oh, that's wonderful. That is a special memory. See, you are so much better than me because I... And she <laughs> is. She really <laughs> is. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so not my favorite. So, um, I remember dreading that because it was usually near the longest day of the year and you couldn't do anything till sundown. And it, meant, it was like, this is never ending. Um, but, uh, and the names were always so difficult. We, we were always checking and double checking because if you got one thing wrong at the Secret Service gate, the, the person was stopped and to take 20 minutes to get them in with the right information. So it was always a challenge. So I'm so glad that you have more positive <laughs> spin on it. Oh, you know, um, having worked eight years in the Clinton administration and then four years in the Obama administration, you really get to know um, your boss well. Um, and you get to know their family very well, very intimately. Um, as was pointed out to you, Lee, that you know, you're gonna have to know these folks and, and, and they'll be by often. What is um, something about, what it was, was a special, a, a special story or a special aspect of, of the Bushes and the Obamas that you'd like to talk about that you feel most people just really don't know about them? Well, um, I didn't know the Bushes at all when I went to work for them. And one of the first things Mrs. Bush asked me when I started was to try to work with the chef because they didn't seem like they were all on the same page. And I did to, to no avail, and after several months, the chief usher made the decision that the chef would be asked to resign and be given full honors and a great reference and so forth. And he, the chef did not feel that that was fair, and so he immediately went to the New York Times and said he'd been fired um, by a Dolce & Gabbana pantsuit-wearing socialite, me. <laughs> And I really wasn't involved in anything except trying to help him. And I was shocked because, you know, I'm still pretty much a housewife who ended up working at the White House somehow. And now I'm in the New York Times. And now, and to be called a socialite, I mean, that is an insult. So um, <laughs> I, I was really mopey that next day at work. I kind of wandered around feeling sorry for myself and being very, very quiet. And at the end of the day, the Bushes had a, a dinner in the family residence. And I was seeing the last of their guests out. And the president walked over to me and he said, hey, I hear you fired the chef. And he started to laugh. And I thought, oh, this is so kind of him. I had no idea that he was that kind of person who would notice among all the staff he deals with every day that I'm really down. And I just I was surprised, because I think he, a president has so many other things to think about. And it was actually very thoughtful of him. And it gave me some perspective, because you know people were saying a lot worse things about him every day. Mm. And you know, so why should I be upset about being called a socialite? <laughs> Um, I, there, one of the things as social secretary is you try to keep a low profile overall. So, you know, why put a target on your back? And, it, and, and so you always tried to not be in the paper. And then I found out that the New York Times was working on an article about me and I was scared to death. And the reporter called me and I said, no, I'm not, I'm, I'm not gonna participate. There's no, in a sense, no reason for a story here. Well, the article comes out, and I find out on Friday that it's in the Sunday New York Times, and I am at home with the uh, duvet over my head, like, I don't want to go outside. This is, you know, I was just, I was just horrified how people would react, what would be said, and the next day at the White House, I was so kind of like rattled by it because I, I didn't, it, it was something I tried to stay away from. And after an event, the president says to me, as we're walking to the elevator, he goes, Jeremy, wow, damn good article. And, a, and nice photos. How do you do that? They don't do either for me. I mean, it was, a, <laughs> so it was uh, and he's like, you're, you're doing a great job. And, and as you know, it always felt good, no matter what, having that, uh, affirmation and uh, kindness. So they were, they were really 
uh, generous in that way. Mm, that's lovely. I agree. They're very generous. Um, one of my favorite um, uh, chapters is using humor and charm in the book to deflect, in particularly embarrassing, awkward moments. Now, thank you so very much for putting my <laughs> most, oops, sorry, I think I just, just blasted the, the sound guy's ears here. You never sounded better. <laughs> thank you, dear. Uh, one of my most embarrassing moments, um, if you Google Capricia Marshall Fall, you'll get a wonderful video of me going down the North Portico steps during the visit of President Calderon of, of Mexico, and I am uh, half uh, Mexican. And so my entire family in Cleveland, Ohio, was watching this uh, occur, and I can hear everyone yelling from Cleveland, Ohio, ay caramba. It was horrible. <laughs> uh, and I relive it often with my son, who thinks it's really funny to pull it up and have it going, me going up and down, up and down, up and down the steps. Uh, but I love that chapter because um, most people just kind of cringe, and they, they fall, they become a turtle in a shell, and oh gosh, and they can't. Uh, talk a little bit about your most embarrassing moment or awkward moment, <laughs> and then how did you use charm and humor to sort of carry on the day? Well, we should explain that when she says she went down, she was dressed in the most beautiful Audrey Hepburn-esque mm -hmm. ball gown, and the North Portico steps are marble and very, very slippery, and she, she fell down backward, and the photographer started taking pictures, and President Obama said, stop, don't take the pictures. And she got up like a swan. Mm. And she opened the door, and she welcomed the Mexican president like it never happened. So that's why she's in the charm chapter, because she did it so beautifully herself. You know, I, I got dangerously close one time. There, at a previous government shutdown, there we were, the government was shut down for two weeks, and none of my staff they, they make were only essential workers, and I don't know how they decide who's essential, but essential workers can be at the White House. The others legally can't show up for work. So it was two weeks, and it got settled, and it was a Friday, and the, uh, there was an event in the East Room, and the president walks in before going to, and he walks into the blue room where the military guards were, everyone, all the assistants were, and he goes, hey, everyone, it's, it's good to have you back. Yeah, and they were like, thank you, Mr. President, it's good to be back. He goes, yeah, you know, Jeremy was running things for a while here, and that's scary. And I said, <laughs> and I laughed, and I said, yeah, Mr. President, yeah. By the way, now that people are back, I can work on that, that website if you need. And it was healthcare.gov. And you just heard everyone go, who? And I think Biden was looking at me like he was going to kill me. And then the president puts on that big smile and starts laughing. I said, too soon, Mr. President? He goes, yeah, too soon, too soon. <laughs> everyone laughed once he laughed. But until then, they were like, this man is, yeah, keep him away. That's awesome. Do you have a story? You, uh, you know, I don't think I handled this with great charm or humor, but I handled it. Uh, <laughs> there was a, a particularly difficult official dinner, uh, a luncheon for the Chinese, and it was marred from the very beginning because there was a heckler at the arrival ceremony, which was very insulting to the Chinese president, and then the WACA, the White House communications announcer, referred to him as the president of the Republic of China rather than the People's Republic of China. And you know, they care about that a lot. Um, yeah, we heard about it. Yes. <laughs> I bet you, you probably, the delegations will hear about it forever. Right. And they thought it was intentional. And um, it, they were just both stupid mistakes. The heckler was let in on a press pass. Uh, and so then the delegation started pulling out of the luncheon. And I had been told by the State Department before the luncheon that there is a thing that the Chinese sometimes do, which is to try to have their translator work for both their president and our president. And I was told not to let that happen under any circumstances. So I went over, and immediately, of course, the Chinese translator has pushed the American translator out of her seat. And she's standing behind it, looking kind of crestfallen. And I explained that the Chinese woman needed to move so that the American president could have his translator, and she pretended she didn't speak English. Um, and so, you know, I turned to the American translator and said, when I get this chair open, I want you to sit in it and do not get out of it until this luncheon is over. 
And I tipped the woman's chair forward a couple of inches, and she jumped up and whirled on me in a fury. And I pushed our translator into the seat, and then I could see the, the Chinese chief of protocol coming at me like he was going to physically attack me. And just that moment, I was literally saved by the Marine band who struck up hail to the chief because the two presidents had entered the East Room, and that was it. My most embarrassing, but also probably my most uh, disappointing moment as social secretary. I would have to say that you know, that's imperatively important you know, from our perspective at the State Department because it is, that translator is the voice of the leader. And so whatever comes out of them, that is taken verbatim by fact. And so we don't, we don't know what you know, our bilateral partners translators saying, you know, if they're, if they're actually translating, because I mean, we don't speak Mandarin, right? And so you, what you did was bravo for you. You did the <laughs> absolutely right thing to do. And yeah, you know, if you have to tip them out of a chair, you gotta tip them out of a chair, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, like, that's what you gotta do. So that's probably also your difficult person um, scenario, <laughs> I, would, I would guess. Um, Jeremy, uh, um, Cappy talked a little bit about managing you know, a, a story, a wonderful story uh, earlier about managing um, difficult people um, in the White House. Uh, you, you, as, as you mentioned, there's lots of Secret Service, the formality of being in the White House. Um, how did you deal with uh, folks who were disappointed um, or you know, we all have heard the, well, I'm just gonna go to the president then when you tell them no. Right. How right. did you manage people like It that? was the, one of the things I had talked to Mrs. Obama about in the interview was that to get more people into the White House and that from an outsider, it seemed like there was the same people going in and that there was, they had, there were so many people to get in. And she said, Abs you're absolutely right. So I would go through the holiday list that I would get from the DNC and from Ledger Fair and I would, cross out people, I had my staff look and see how many parties they had been, and I crossed them out. And I got so much hell for it, but Valerie Jarrett went with me to the DNC and said, this list is no good. And they gave us more people, new people. I would get calls from people saying, well, I've been to the last two parties. I mean, why would I not be able to go to the holiday party this year? And I'm like, uh, during the Clinton administration, I got three invitations over eight years. And I was thrilled and surprised each time I got one. And there, was, there are, some people have a feeling of entitlement. And it's, you once said, because you were dealing with a country it, where the delegation had been left outside because of some information Security wrong, issues, right? and how they reacted by oh, when you went making you, uh, and you said, you know, just remember you're dealing with school kids at all levels. And it, it really was, you know, you really, people would say, well, I understand why they need more people in, but they want to see me. I'm important. Mm -hmm. And you had to manage and someone would complain to me that they, they were at a dinner in the East Room and by the window looking out, uh, the, the North Lawn, and she said, could you put me any further from the President and First Lady? And I was like, there are no bad seats mm -mm, in the White House. Mm -mm. Oh, well, and we all hear the same thing. After the Clinton administration, yeah, guests would so. come to us and say, you know, they had a lot more people here for this event in the Clinton years, or, you know, their parties used to go much later into the night, and you're pushing us out, it's 9.30. We could never meet the standard that people came to expect after going to Clinton events. <laughs> <laughs> you had a boss that Enjoyed. thrived yeah. on it. And he, he would go and he'd be scheduled, what, for an hour and he'd be there for two, two. three hours. And people started to think that's the norm. And mm -hmm. it, it really isn't. No, so it was, Bill Clinton. yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's Bill Clinton time. Yeah. <laughs> that's what we called it. Um, I, in just a couple of minutes, I think, uh, are we okay on time? Can we keep going a bit longer? Okay, um, so if for those who are interested in queuing up for a question, please begin to do so now. I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna talk through one more scenario and then 
we're going to um, bring it out to you in the audience. Again, the microphones are in the aisles. Um, Lee, you talked about, uh, and, I, and I really, again, this chapter is so spectacular, I think, and, and, and the advice is, is really, uh, everyone should, should take to it, is listen first and talk later. Um, and, and you really, you, know, you talk about how navigating the White House is like sometimes walking a tightrope, and um, you, you know, people, of, of course, are congratulating you on your wonderful accomplishments, but they're really looking for like when you don't do well. Um, and it always happens that there are those scenarios when uh, you have very high-level guests and things are um, you know, just at their peak of importance. And you tell a wonderful story about how you, um, I'm not gonna get it right, but the type of listening, that it, intenti in, intent attentive, attentive uh, mm -hmm. listening. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, you know, um, you have to think about the kind of individual who's drawn to work in a White House as a political staffer. They are hyper ambitious, they're combative, they love politics, they love to fight about everything, however insignificant, and they love status. And there's an attitude that, you know, if they can take a little power away from you, they're definitely going to do it because it's just fun. And then you have people like Jeremy and me coming into a White House, and we're basically civilians in that sense. We aren't thinking like that. So it's a little bit harder for people like us to interact with those people successfully because they tend to view nice, being nice and as a form of weakness and something you can walk all over. So we had to learn to listen really carefully to what people like that had to say and fi try to figure out what they really wanted, what they really needed, and if we could give it to them, we would. But we didn't engage and we didn't develop feuds and we really tried to keep away from all of that stuff, which is rife in every White House, um, because you can't get anything accomplished like that. It's a complete waste of time. And so you have to learn to listen very, very carefully, not just to what people are saying, but what they're not saying, mm. try to figure out what they want. And then sometimes when you need to communicate with them, instead of coming right out and saying, well, what is it you really need, you have to do this thing we call funneling, where you say, so how are your kids? And they say, fine, and say, you know, we haven't seen you around much. Is everything okay? And then maybe they'll say to you, well, actually, my wife's been really sick and down with the flu, and you can understand why they haven't been showing up for work on time, instead of starting in by saying, your absenteeism is a problem, and I'm seriously thinking about firing you. So there are just more diplomatic ways to listen and to then communicate to get to a place where you can work over the long term with people who might not be so pleasant or easy to work with. I think we see it. I was watching the other day one of the cable news networks. I won't say which one because that's, that gets sticky. But um, I was watching and there, was, there were two guests and one had his talking points and the other had his talking points and they didn't listen at all to each other. All they did was go through the same talking points. It, it, we really have gotten it, and it was who was gonna get the best jab, mm -hmm. who was gonna win the battle. And it was never gonna be uh, won by anyone because they were both screaming at each other. So mm -hmm. I think we've gotten in a time where is, it is very popular in reality TV, which I will admit I don't watch, but I know enough that bad behavior is what the producers like and what they want. And so we're seeing how bad behavior is rewarded in those instances, but that's different than in life. And, and it's really important, you don't wanna be, it's one thing to be on TV and trying to get the ratings. You don't wanna be that person that people remember, oh my God, were they impossible. Mm. And uh, so it's, I think we just need to step back, take a breath, and not react, because reacting so quickly is often what gets us in trouble. Mm. Yeah, no, I agree. Does anyone have a question from the audience? Yes. Oh, wonderful. I have a question. Uh, was there a condition of your employment in this very special category that you had restrictions as to what kind of a book you might like to write someday? Did you have to sign a, some kind of uh, document that would restrict your um, 
uh, your vocaliz <laughs> vocalization or written word? Well, I will tell you that I think recent history shows there is no such document for the federal, <laughs> federal voice. Um, there is no, I, I, don't even, I don't believe it's allowed. It certainly was not even talked about in the uh, Obama administration. I'm sure not in the Bush either. I think that um, it's, you know, we, it, the next book we're gonna write is called This Is What We Really Think, and we're gonna do the, all the trash stories. But, um, it, you know, we feel very lucky to have worked for such uh, generous and wonderful bosses. And so the last thing we wanna do is do anything that embarrasses them or has a story where someone is embarrassed because we name them or they do something. So we always use code, except for Capricia, because it's on video. But it was, um, you know, it really, you can't write a book about treating people well and then trash people, much as we would have liked to at times. <laughs> yeah, we kind of self-censored. And, um, you know, not everyone, everyone's human. Not everyone behaves perfectly every day. And sometimes we have off moods. And, you know, you wouldn't want to be described based on that one really terrible day you had. And so we tried to average things out. But there was never any kind of... Uh, um, agreement to be signed and when we finished the book I sent it to Mrs. Bush and I said if there's anything you don't like please let me know and she didn't change a thing. Thank you. Sir? Uh, my question is how many different bosses or people did you have to answer to? The president, the first lady, the chief of staff, secret service, all of the above? Uh, it's a good question. The truth of the matter is, is we reported to the president, and that was our boss. Uh, I think it was Gail Burt talked about one time, uh, maybe it was Don Reagan or something, said she was fired. And Mrs. Reagan was like, what is he talking about? He, he can't do anything. You know, he, he's not in charge of you. I, we really answered to the president, but... I went every morning to the senior staff meeting, which was run by the chief of staff. And I tried to keep the chief of staff as informed as they wanted to be on things coming up. And, you know, Jack Lou would say to me, just tell me where I have to show up. And uh, whereas Daly wanted details, why was this person on the list? Why was that person? So we learned how to navigate to make sure people felt like we were listening to them. But... Uh, we really, I don't feel that we had a bunch of bosses. We just had a lot of, there were a few people that like to stir the pot, but bosses, it worked out pretty well. Everything is moving so fast that it's difficult for people to really get in your business for very long because by the time they get around to figuring out what's happened, the event's over. And so I kind of took advantage of that as much as I could. But I, I think every uh, White House is different. I worked much more with Mrs. Bush than I did with President Bush directly. And so um, I just would call her up and say, what do you think about this or that? Or she had a wonderful way of coming down to the East Wing, and she'd pop her head in the door and say, well, what are you working on? And she'd sit down, and I'd show her what I was doing, and we'd have a nice chat, and she'd go down the hall to the correspondence office or the press office. And that way, you know, everyone in the staff felt like they had a personal relationship with her, she was building loyalty without, I think, even maybe realizing that's what she was doing because it was clear that she cared about not just the jobs we were doing but us personally. And so I felt like we all worked with her uh, pretty regularly and she was very hands-on. I would have to say that every social secretary works very, very closely to and with their with, their, um, with the First Lady. Uh, but ultimately, we all in the White House served at the pleasure of the President. And so he really, he up until now, will, will always have the ultimate say on whether someone stays or goes. In the second inauguration, before it, there was a, uh, the week before there were some receptions. And at the end of one of the receptions, I was with the president and Mrs. Obama and Jay Carney, and we were talking about something which I don't remember except that the president had said something about Mrs. Obama's hair the day before that didn't go over well. So 
he said something to me, and I said, oh, like the comment about her hair? And he goes, what are you doing? Why would you say that? You know, you work for me. You are assistant to the president, not to the first lady. She, she can't fire you, I can. And I grabbed Mrs. Obama's arm. She was like holding my hand. I grabbed her, I put my head on her shoulder and said, but I know who the real boss is. <laughs> <laughs> wise, very wise. Yes, sir. Uh, what can you say about your position in the current administration with all the chaos that's up there now? Well, the person who has the job now, whom we all know, is a wonderful event uh, planning professional, and she's been doing it for 20 years. She doesn't come from politics, but she certainly knows how to do events, and I think she's very good. Yeah, I, I don't know her as well as you do, as long as you do, but she is wonderful, and she was very gracious to host us uh, in December, and I think she's doing a great job. I don't know what's real and isn't real because so many things are rumors, so I tried to stay away from it. Once, we kind of talked about our experiences and our predecessors, and we'll let who's there now talk about this once they're done. That's a quick, good way of not answering the question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, I'd like to know, you're very fine people, and I'd like to know how you got this job. <laughs> Everybody always asks that, because, and it's different for each of us, really. Well, how did you get the job? Uh, well, I was working in the White House already. Um, I was a uh, special assistant to the First Lady and worked very closely with my predecessor, Ann Stock. And, um, and because I work so closely with her, and you get to know the style <laughs> and, um, and the manner in which the First Family really wants to do things, um, Mrs. Uh, uh, Clinton then um, asked me if I, if I wanted, this, wanted this position, and I was so incredibly touched by her offer because um, you know I was already performing a job that was important in, in, in her life and in the, the frame of the frame of the White House. But um, you know she wanted me to grow in my career, and that's what she said to me. She said, "You need to have this position uh, now, Capricia. You need to rise and and become a manager and have a staff, and it's time for you in your career." And I was just. So touched that she was thinking about me personally uh, in that way and offered me you know, the opportunity of a lifetime. These jobs are really extraordinary. Um, they're hard, but you have so much fun doing them. They're very creative. There's nothing like sitting down and thinking, okay, we're doing a, a dinner to honor Shakespeare's birthday. What are all the ways I can do to make this really unique and special? And it's just enormously creative and you have this wonderful staff of calligraphers and chefs and everyone who makes it work and makes it work so well. Mm. I basically have no idea, to answer your question, how I got this job. <laughs> I truly did not think that I would ever have the job. And I realized uh, quickly that one of the reasons we all had the job is because the President and First Lady really trusted us and knew we had their back. And I think that goes to loyalty and to the importance of trust because I, I think that she really, she said, I want someone that is political and understands us and has our back. And I think that's in a, the only answer I can give. The, what I would tell interns, because they would often ask, I said, I didn't plan this and it happened. So sometimes, it's better not to have a rigid plan if you're, you have a gut reaction to do something different. And um, mm. that's what I did throughout, I, when I was working in the campaign and it started to look like he was gonna win, I thought, I'm not moving to DC. I was living <laughs> in LA, I didn't want to move to DC. But things just happened and that's, I think, kind of how it worked with all of us. It, it was, wish we could say we planned it. Do we have time for one more question? Okay, I think this has to, oh, do we have, oh, we have one more. Hi. Hi. Um, my question mm -hmm. is, I mean, you all had such extraordinary experiences in the White House. What have you taken from that time into your personal lives now? Like there's sort of this before and after. What have you learned from being there that you 
um, find extremely valuable now in your lives? That is a great question, and it is the point of the book also. Um, I found that it changed me as a person. Um, when you're very motivated to make sure that every interaction you have with every person you're encountering is positive, um, it changes how you do things. And um, we never wanted to be in the newspaper for a negative press story. We never wanted to do anything that would embarrass the president or first lady. And that just alters everything you do. So if someone comes up and they're irate and they're complaining, you don't yell back. You try to accommodate them and you deflect and diffuse and you do whatever you can to please them. And so, you know, sometimes I used to think I had a thousand bosses because whatever anybody wanted, that's what I would try to do to keep them happy. And if you keep doing that over and over, it changes how you interact with people and you stop being as combative. You have a little more patience. You listen a little more carefully. And it really, you know, honestly made me a nicer person, which is why I think the book is useful because we could all do with being a little bit nicer now and then. And, you know, uh, the other thing I learned uh, watching the Bushes was how important details are. Details really matter in life. Um, and I remember one night, it had been a really long, hard day. There had been several events. It had been snowing and sleeting the whole day, and so getting people in and out of the White House had been chaotic. And I was finally leaving at about 9.30 at night, and I was exhausted. I'm dressed like, you know, social secretary with high heels and skirts. Not you as social secretary. <laughs> <laughs> and I was... <laughs> it did, it did. <laughs> I was dreading going out to my car. And I walked outside in the snow and the sleet, and someone of the groundskeepers had cleaned off my car. And it brought me almost to tears. I was so grateful. It was such a little thing. It meant so much. And the point of the book is that the little things that you do, the incremental changes you make, can really be life-changing in terms of how people respond to you. And then it makes your life easier and less stressful because life is just easier when people like you. Uh, what I took from the White House, some of the Reagan China. <laughs> <laughs> No, that would be illegal. Um, the R.S. Nixon would say that would be wrong. Um, I think it was really that I remembered coming to the Clinton White House the first time I'd come, and it was, it tells you something, that I called from California to RSVP, and whoever answered was telling me about this great new thing, Hotwire. And if I hadn't gotten my ticket to use it, go on that because you get cheaper tickets, cheaper hotels. They were so helpful. And you give up, uh, or you have to say a lot to get in the White House. You have to give your social security number, birth dates. You won't believe how many people get to the gate. And something didn't go right, and they have to secretly tell the Secret Service, oh, that really wasn't the year I was born. But <laughs> it is, it's not easy to get in. And what you really want is people to feel welcomed. Mm -hmm. And I felt that uh, when I was there. and. I told Mrs. Obama, I think that's what is the most important, is they get in, that they feel welcomed after going through the metal detector, the dog that sniffs, the, the you know, the gate, uh, and the line, you want them to feel welcomed. Mm. Well, we cannot thank you both enough for okay. this beautiful book, for these wonderful, wonderful stories, the anecdotes, and especially the extraordinary, extraordinarily poignant advice. Um, again, I hope everyone goes out and buys five to ten copies each. Bless you. <laughs> and, uh, and we want to thank uh, the LBJ Library and Foundation. Thank you all so very much for this invitation. Um, and let's all leave and uh, try to teach, try to treat people very well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.